Okay, why don't we get started? So welcome to everybody who's out there among the world of the attendees. My name is Ava Ayers. I'm the director of the Government Law Center, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to our first online Warren M. Anderson Legislative Seminar. As you know, we traditionally do these in the Assembly Parlor at the New York State Capitol. Of course, that's not possible during the COVID-19 shutdown. So we're very grateful to our panelists and our sponsors for accommodating our new online um, world. I'm very grateful to Albany Law School for um, making this possible with the technology that we have today. And I just want to say uh, thank you specifically to the sponsors of this year's Anderson series, the Rafay Group PC, uh, and a donation in memory of Sharon P. O'Connor, Albany Law School class of 1979. Those are the sponsors for our overall series. And then today we are specifically sponsored also by Greenberg Traurig LLP, by Harris Beach PLLC, and by the New York Municipal Insurance Reciprocal. And we're very grateful to all of them. For those of you on the phone who are lawyers and want CLE credit, which you're welcome to get, um, please make sure to fill out and email the forms that you received along with your registration, which are fillable PDFs. If you have questions, you can contact Lisa Rivage, uh, whose name you can see here on the screen. She takes care of all of our CLE issues and um, she can help you with any questions you might have. So I want to um, turn it over to our moderator for today. Um, but before I do that, a quick word about how things are going to work. Questions and answers. We encourage you, um, people in the audience, to ask questions. If you put your mouse over your computer screen, you should see a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. If you push that button, a window will open where you can submit questions. I'll be watching that, and I will read questions to the panel at the end. Feel free to submit them as we go. But do please use that Q&A function for all questions if you'd like to ask the panelists something. With that, uh, let me turn it over to Richard Rifkin. And our, I'm uh, very proud to say Richard is the Government Law Center's new legal director. So this is hardly his first Anderson seminar, but it is his first um, in that capacity. Richard, thanks so much. Thank you, Ava. It's also my first online uh, Anderson uh, program. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, in these difficult times. We're presenting this program because we need to think through one of the most critical issues facing us. Everyone knows that the restoring of the health of our citizens and the economy of our nation are critical. But so too is the maintenance of our democracy. And that, I say to all of you, is the responsibility of the legal community. That means us, all of us. We need to lead this effort. Democracy has survived the Civil War, the Great Depression, two world wars, and the attacks of uh, September 11th, 2001. It will survive the current crisis as long as we face the challenging problems and solve them. Today, we have four experts who will offer their thoughts on the federal, state, and local issues that we face. They will not have all the answers as the future is uncertain and the challenges are complex. What they will do is inform us of where we are at this moment in time and then suggest the issues that we will need to resolve to assure that the upcoming elections in 2020 are truly meaningful. And that means that voters are able and willing to cast their ballots. Jennifer Wilson, who is the Deputy Director of the League of Women Voters, will talk about what has taken place and what is now going on in Albany. 
John Nona, who is the uh, county attorney of Westchester County, will describe the problems faced by the counties and the county boards of elections, which in the end are responsible for actually conducting the elections. Jerry Goldfeder, who is uh, special counsel to Strook and Strook and Levan, will talk about some of the issues that we face under the federal constitution and statutes. And finally, um, Hillary Jockmans, who is a consultant in Washington, D.C., but has a real connection to New York State. Uh, she has been the chair of the uh, Bar State Bar Association's Federal Legislative Priorities Committee for some years now. She's going to talk about what is going on in Washington and some of the federal issues uh, that uh, will be considered, even though the states have ultimate responsibility for conduct conducting the elections in their jurisdictions. So with that, let me turn it over to our panelists and get started in discussion. And uh, Jennifer Wilson, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Richard. And thank you for having me on this panel. I'm very excited. I'm gonna quickly do a screen share for everyone. So I opted to put together a PowerPoint because I know how it can be on these webinars where someone's just sort of, it's just sort of a talking head at you. So I thought it might be helpful to have some slides with some text on it. Of course, feel free to screenshot any of these and I'm happy to share them after. But as Richard mentioned, I'm gonna be covering sort of the macro state view, what's going on in New York State right now as it relates to COVID-19 and what we're potentially going to see from the legislature as we continue moving closer and closer to the 2020 elections. So this is just a broad strokes overview of the major changes that have come from the executive. There have been three major pieces of executive orders that have come down related to voting. The first thing the governor did was change the amount of signatures actually required for candidates to appear on the ballot. And then following that, he postponed our April primary and special election until June. And he also postponed the village and school board elections. We don't have a clear date for those. We do expect them to be sometime in June, likely June 16th to line up with other village elections that take place around the state. And then the third component he did, which we see as being one of the biggest components is expanding absentee voting in New York State. So now anyone can apply to vote via absentee under the excuse of temporary illness and he also waived the signature requirements so we can actually apply for absentee ballots without requiring that signature so you can apply electronically and these provisions will all expire after june so there is some questions as to whether or not we will need to renew these later but besides that question there are a lot of other questions around these executive orders if you actually look at them they're all quite vague so the State Board of Elections has been trying to pick these apart and figure out what exactly the governor was trying to say with these, but there's questions around registration deadlines, did those change? The Anyone who submitted an absentee ballot before this change, are those ballot applications still valid? If you actually did submit a ballot for April for the presidential primary, will your ballot count going forward? So there's a lot of discrepancy in the executive order and we really need guidance from the governor for the state board of elections and for county boards of elections to tell us exactly how he wants this all to be interpreted. This is like a broad strokes uh, sort of overview of what our current process is for absentee voting. A very small portion of New York State voters actually vote by absentee. So I thought this might be helpful for people who have never voted by absentee to see this. And this is really what the league is working on, making sure that people understand how to vote by absentee, what the process is actually like in New York State and how they can get a ballot. So even though it's really only four steps, it's a lot of work on the voter to actually complete these four steps. The voter has to print out the absentee ballot, fill it out and sign it, post their own postage on there to get it to their county board of elections. Even though there is this electronic piece now, 
There is some question as to whether every single county is going to do this, how exactly this is going to work. So once the application gets to the County Board of Elections, the County Board of Elections has to process the application and then within 32 days ahead of the election or as soon as they receive it, if it's after 32 days, they're going to send that ballot to the voter. And once the voter gets that ballot, they've got to fill it out, they've got to sign it again, have to pay for their own postage to send that ballot back to the Board of Elections. And each ballot has a unique barcode that lets the Board of Elections identify the voter, but the ballot itself, the, the envelope, the return envelope, doesn't have any sort of marking on it so that the Board of Elections or U.S. Postal Service can track it when it's in the mail. So the voter and the county boards of elections really don't have a way to track these ballots in the mail. So the fourth part is the Board of Elections getting the ballots back, processing the ballots, counting the ballots, but voters have a limited amount of time of when they can actually submit these. So they have to be postmarked either the day before election and arrive no later than seven days following the elections. And if we look at some of the challenges to the existing system, as I mentioned, it's only a small number of voters actually vote by absentee. It's less than 5% in New York State. And ballots are frequently lost in the mail. They never make it back to the Board of Elections or they arrive a lot later than they were intended to. And county boards of elections, it's not for a lack of trying. They try the best they can. Most county boards of elections have really, really small budgets and they really don't have the materials necessary right now to scale up absentee voting to this huge amount of voters requesting absentee ballots that we think we're going to be seeing in the upcoming election. So the state, the League of Women Voters of New York State is also very concerned about public information around this and public education. And it, the county boards of elections are often attached to their county website. So there's usually limited information on their websites as well. We did a survey of all 62 County Board of Elections websites to see what kind of information was available on there. And it was really alarming to see 32 counties didn't even mention on their website that this rule change had taken place. And three counties only had a link to the application and had no other information, no information how to submit it, no information on where to call or what to do. We did see eight counties that said that people could call and request that a form be mailed to them. And two counties have actually set up online electronic systems, Erie and Livingston, where voters can just type in their information, hit send, submit, and get uh, their ballot in the mail. So there's a huge discrepancy in every single county of what counties are doing are planning on doing and that just makes public education even harder for voters to understand what they're supposed to be doing. The State Board of Election has issued guidance on their website and their guidance is really great. They've also issued guidance to the County Boards of Elections of what they are hoping to see counties do but because our County Boards of Election have so much autonomy they don't have to do really what the State Board of Elections says. And that's great, we think that's great. We think every county should be able to adapt to their individual voters, their individual constituency. But when we're having this huge health crisis all across the state, it is very helpful to have every single county doing the same thing. It just helps with voter education and publicizing these changes. So what are some other additional challenges outside of public education, outside of making sure people are gonna get ballots? Something that the league is thinking about is disenfranchisement of either voters with language barriers or voters with disabilities. Also, how are we going to attract, uh, track these ballots and applications? Do we have the capacity to do this at this point? Another huge issue is the post is it issue. As I mentioned, if people are going to mail these uh, applications in and mail the ballot in, that's paying for postage two times for voters. And a lot of people have lost their jobs. And it's very onerous to be asking them to pay for postage at this point. And then, of course, if this health crisis continues, are we going to have to renew these executive orders? Are we going to have to go through this whole process all over again? There are some state legislative fixes pending. This is the piece of legislation that I feel like I've heard the most uh, advocates talking about, Jacobson and Biagi bill. This basically would codify what the governor did to expand the term illness to cover any sort of potential 
spreadable communicable disease at a time of a declaration of a state of emergency. So it just expands the definition of illness in the Constitution, which is another sort of confusing part of some of these executive orders is absentee voting is in our state constitution. So it's something that is difficult to amend via statute because there needs to be another component of amending the Constitution. And there is a bill that had first passage that would take out the cause for absentee voting from the Constitution, but it only passed last year. It still has to pass again next year and then go on the ballot for voters to vote on. But this expansion of the word or the definition of illness would count for the November elections and take away some of that insecurity of whether or not we're going to have to do this all again. Another bill that's been talked about a lot is by Senator Myrie, who's the chair of the Elections Committee, and this would expand absentee ballot requests, and it would allow people to request an absentee ballot up to two days ahead of the election, which sounds great, but going back to all of the issues raised earlier, two days ahead of the election, that's during the end of early voting, that's that last Sunday of early voting, that's usually when county boards of elections are the most stressed out, trying to make sure their voter rolls are ready for election day the following Tuesday, and also two days to get all of these requests in the mail to be processed to come back if we're just not really sure if this is enough time. And this would also um, shorten the deadline for postmarking to be postmarked the day of election day. So it just kind of moves some of the deadlines around and also codifies uh, electronic submission of ballots to waive that signature requirement. And this one is only in the Senate. There's no assembly sponsor at this point. And then the final bill we've really been looking at is this Dinowitz Sanders bill that would require the county boards of elections postmark uh, the return postage or the return envelope for voters so that when voters send their ballots back, they're not the ones upfronting that cost. And we think this is great, but again, county boards of elections, that's a lot of money for them to be spending outside of the increase in materials and staff and all these other different costs that are gonna be adding up really quickly to now pay for postage is, is a lot of money. So Jennifer, can I interject with just one quick question oh, from sure. the Q&A? On the applications, can people apply for absentee ballots for multiple elections at the same time? In other words, for yes. June and November? Yes. And that's another question from the beginning that if someone in the beginning, if somebody before the governor issued his executive order marked, oh, I want an absentee ballot for all of these elections and either marked temporary illness or some people have just written COVID on their absentee applications, does that count? And you would think, no, it wouldn't count. You just wrote COVID on your application. So there is definitely, we need more guidance from the governor on this. And we need more money, which is my next slide, talking about some of the funding opportunities. We just passed our state budget, and unfortunately, our state budget did not recognize that we were eligible for $20 million in federal funding for elections through the CARES Act stimulus package. There was $400 million included in there through HAVA, and New York State would have gotten $20 million and had to have promised a 20% match, approximately $4 million. And unfortunately, the state budget didn't recognize this funding, didn't include any sort of dry budget line. So the State Board of Elections had to submit their application last week and had to ask for zero dollars because the state wasn't recognizing that we were going to be getting these funds and going to be allowed to spend these funds. And the Board of Elections did say that counties, the 20% match they could provide through the money that they would spend anyway could be that $4 million. But without the necessary budget language in our state budget, we cannot accept these funds. And these funds are meant to cover all the things I just mentioned, the increase in envelopes, the postage, increase in staff, uh, ginning up poll sites to have less people there on election day. This funding is essential in every sense of the word. So then there's the question of will the legislature return, which I think is a, a very sort of pending thing. The Assembly and Senate both passed uh, House resolutions to allow them to do remote voting procedures. We've heard they've talked about it over their April break. They've had conferences on different things remotely, but there is no word yet as to whether or not they've gotten the technology up and running to actually vote remotely. But of course, this would be essential to be able to come back to work with, to be able to work remotely. So we're not really sure yet if they're gonna come back. 
And some final policy considerations for New York State. These are some things I've heard kind of floating around the mailing a ballot to all registered voters. We just don't think it's very viable in New York State where our voter rolls, because we have people move so frequently in New York State, our voter rolls are almost always incorrect. There's lots of people who have moved and so it's just not very viable in New York State. Expanding early in-person voting we think is a great way to reduce lines on election day and great, make sure that there isn't a huge swath of people at the polls at any given time. But this is another thing that requires extra funding. And then the final slide says um, absentee ballot drop boxes. And this is something that works well in other states like Colorado and Washington, but it's something else that requires time and money to actually get set up. So that is my big picture of the state. And I think John is gonna cover some of these things in more detail too, as it relates to localities. So thank you so much. And I will take down my, uh, <laughs> my okay. screen share. Okay, thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, you have pointed out all the responsibilities of the county boards of elections. And that is John's challenge. So John, how's that gonna work on the county level? under section 29A of the executive law, which allows him to suspend and modify state law subject to the constitutional requirements of federal law to suspend for 30 days. So this has already been suspended. Uh, 20215 was issued back in March, uh, I'm sorry, April 9th. So he's gonna have to renew it uh, in order to go forward with the June primary on June 23rd. It's only good for 30 days, his executive orders. Uh, and we can see that people, even if some of these social distancing restrictions and uh, prohibitions against mass gatherings uh, or large gatherings are relaxed, people may still be reluctant to come to a polling place where there's other people and they might be, might be very difficult to maintain social distance. People will have to uh, wear masks and also would affect the poll workers who are at those polling sites. And will they wanna come to work? And we'll, get, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, it's interesting, other executive orders create problems for local board of elections. Uh, he, one of the executive orders postponed uh, school district, village and school district elections. So those are general elections, they're not primaries. School district elections are particularly important because in school districts, people vote on the school budget and the budget, the, the, their year, their, their, their fiscal year is coming up for renewal. So. So far, there's been a postponement of village and school board uh, elections, but no new date has been set for those elections. And it's been determined, local boards of elections believe you cannot really combine, it's very difficult to combine a, uh, a general election with a, with a primary election. School board elections are completely separate. They usually take place in the school district itself. Another issue with respect to joining primary and general elections is that there are certain special elections that are going to take place in the 27th congressional district that's western new york that was congressman collins's district three assembly districts and the 50th senate district and tanachi's district those those uh, elections are general elections and they have been postponed till june 23rd the same date as a primary election so local boards of elections are going to have to conduct a in those districts, a special election and a primary election on the same day, leaving aside the whole issue of school board elections and how they affect the school board budget. So those are issues that local boards of elections have to face and they're trying to deal with how to face those, um, how to face those, those challenges. Um, moving on to some of the issues that local boards of elections will face, uh, number one is polling places. I've heard that many polling places are schools, school buildings. Schools are very reluctant to open their schools for large gatherings of people for in-person elections. Um, so that's an issue that uh, the school, the governor may come out with another executive order. He, he mandated the closing of schools. He mandated that schools provide um, uh, food for their students, lunches and breakfasts. He can mandate the school districts keep their buildings open for the primary election on June 23rd. Uh, so that, that's an issue. Um, we have early voting. The local boards of elections had to face the issue of gearing up for early voting last year. So it's relatively new in New York State. And they have to deal with that issue together with the whole issue of absentee ballots and social distancing at polling places. 
um, that's going to be a challenge. Uh, poll workers, as we all know, many of the poll workers are in vulnerable populations. Uh, are they going to want to come to the polls and spend 16 hours a day at the polls exposed to people who may be wearing masks, maybe they won't be wearing masks, maybe the masks aren't sufficient to protect the poll workers. Are they going to issue uh, N95 masks to all poll workers? Uh, the maximum protection that's available with the mask, that hasn't been determined yet. Uh, there's been a question about whether there should be a recruiting effort to recruit college students who are home or not who have left college early or even seniors in high school who may be of voting age to work as poll workers who aren't vulnerable populations and not so prone to uh, having devastating uh, uh, results if they're infected with the virus. There may be real questions of voter turnout so that that's what makes absentee ballots uh, so an important uh, a method for people to vote, to give the people an opportunity to vote by absentee ballot, which essentially, given the governor's order, is voting by mail, uh, which we don't have in New York State. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, the legislature did pass a, a provision, uh, legislation, which would also be a constitutional amendment to eliminate uh, uh, the reason that you need an excuse to vote by absentee ballot. You need to say you're absent from the county or that you're your, as a result of illness. And that, has, that needs another vote by the legislature, hopefully in 2021, and maybe it'll get on the ballot in November of 2021, so we can eliminate uh, the need for an, uh, an excuse to vote by absentee ballot and move closer to a voting by mail uh, type of system. I, I thought it would be helpful to uh, mention uh, what happens in some other jurisdictions, because I think in, in, this, in this context where we're facing these issues in the in the context of a pandemic and a crisis. It's an opportunity to look at our voting systems and our voting methodologies to determine whether we should look at real change. And as Jennifer said, the burden of conducting elections falls upon local boards of elections. They're funded by the counties. The counties, uh, essentially, it's a conducting an election is an unfunded mandate that the counties have to bear. And there, there are costs to co conducting elections and they can be conducted a lot better if there's more funding available, more efficiently and, and more, um, more in tune with the vote, with voting interest and encouraging people to come out to vote. Uh, Wisconsin was a very interesting situation. You all saw what happened there, where the uh, state legislature and the courts forced in-person voting to go forward. Uh, apparently 1.9 million voters voted in that election. Uh, 1.5 million of those voters voted by absentee ballot because there was a effort by various groups to educate the public and get them to come to, to apply for absentee ballots, return the absentee ballots. There were get out the vote efforts to follow up. So there's a kind of going to be a new get out the vote effort for these primaries. It's going to be the campaigns of the candidates that are going to have to educate the voters and target their voters to seek absentee ballots and to return absentee ballots. Jennifer pointed out the challenges that the local boards of elections will have in dealing with the quantity of absentee ballots and absentee ballot applications that they may face and the burden on the voter to have to return that ballot. So one question that has come up is whether at early voting places they could have drop that drop in boxes where people could drop off their absentee ballot. Um, one of the issues is, you know, it's always been raised that Voter fraud is extremely, extremely rare, but the, the most, the clearest way in which voter fraud can be manifest itself is sometimes through absentee balloting. And we saw that in North Carolina in a congressional election where there was a harvesting of absentee ballots. Now, that is really likely to happen, but it's something we need to be aware of if you open up absentee ballots in, in the way in which you receive them and, and accept them back. Um, there are a number of states that vote by mail, Oregon, Colorado, Washington, Utah, and Hawaii, where the, the, the ballot is mailed to the voter. The voter doesn't have to apply. New York could look at that, but we're a much larger state than those other states. And as Jennifer pointed out, there are issues in administering a, a vote by mail system in New York. Several states allow counties within the state to opt to vote by mail, and that may be, maybe should be available in New York to smaller counties. California, North Dakota, and Nebraska are those are examples of those states that allow voting by mail. Some states allow a voter to get on an absentee ballot list 
to all elections, not just choosing certain elections, but getting an automatic ballot, absentee ballot list where an absentee ballot will be mailed to the voter automatically. New York has a system like that, but only for voters with disabilities. And generally that's used for voters in nursing homes who can't get to the polls and can get on a permanent list. But that's something we could look at in New York as well. Moving forward past the June 23rd primary, we don't know what to expect in the 2020 election. Will we be over this pandemic? Will we have a need to have no fault, no excuse absentee ballot going forward all the way to November? That would be a tremendous burden on local boards of elections to have to administer uh, that situation. And then the issue coming up in November as well is poll workers. Poll workers and polling places are gonna continue to be issues. And boards of elections will also have to be able to conduct early voting uh, for the presidential election. So we've got a temporary solution for the June primary, but it remains to be seen where we will be in November. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. We now start to turn our attention to some of the uh, federal issues that we're going to be looking at uh, going forward. And for that, um, let's go to uh, Jerry Goldsvetter. Well, uh, thank you, Richard, and thank you all for uh, joining here uh, today. I must say that um, um, your reports, uh, Jennifer and John, are a little discouraging. Um, I think the takeaway is we are trying our very best here in New York, at least, to deal with this situation, but there are so many unanswered questions uh, with regard to the primary, and we certainly haven't even um, uh, come to grips with how the general election is going to occur. Um, I will say, I'm going to talk about the presidential election, but I will say that after uh, 2001, after we were attacked, I became um, interested in something that I hadn't thought about before, which is what happens if there is a terrorist attack or a natural disaster like an earthquake or a hurricane, um, I didn't even think of a pandemic. Um, what happens if that, any such events occur on or immediately before election day? And the reason I thought about that is because September 11th was a primary election day in New York State. <clears throat> and we essentially had no backup plan as to what to do if something like that uh, would occur. The legislature moved relatively quickly and uh, the election was, uh, the primary elections throughout the state were uh, postponed. But subsequent to that, we've had a number of uh, natural disasters uh, in New York and around the country. And as we, as we learn every day, we are, we've not been prepared and we're still not prepared. Um, uh, Superstorm St Sandy occurred a week before the general election, the presidential election in 2012. And there had been no planning. Even though I and others like me have been writing about this and speaking to governors and United States senators and, and various federal officials uh, about this, there was no plan as to how to conduct this general election um, uh, when there was this natural disaster, really immediately before the presidential uh, election. And so you had uh, a swath of, of um, uh, areas in New York and New Jersey that were wiped out um, uh, because of Superstorm Sandy, and yet the voting needed to go on. Um, New Jersey, uh, Governor Christie at the time instituted internet voting. Um, and in New York State, Governor Cuomo issued an executive order saying that people did not have to vote at their own polling place if they were one of the affected counties. So this was an ad, these were ad hoc uh, measures um, uh, responsive to the particular uh, storm uh, that enabled more people than uh, not to be able to vote. But still, even after that experience, after 9-11, after Superstorm Sandy, after various 
hurricanes in New York State, we do not have, we have not had in New York or nationally a uh, plan, a comprehensive plan as to what to do with regard to uh, conducting election when there is a, um, a disaster such as this pandemic. And we really still don't have it. Now, that is a preface as discouraging as what John and Jem Jennifer was saying. What I'm saying is a little discouraging as well. But we, we, we continue to learn that there are no backup plans. So we will have a presidential election. As everyone who is listening is, I'm sure, acutely aware, is we have a, a presidential election, but it's really 50 different elections, actually 51 different elections, 50 states in Washington, D.C., according to the Constitution of the United States. Um, um, we conduct these elections by voting for electors in the various states and D.C., pledge to a particular presidential candidate. That's the way it works. And therefore, we are bound by the laws and regulations of the various states in conducting their presidential elections, their versions of the presidential election. We don't have federal, we certainly don't have any constitutional parameters as to how to conduct a presidential election. And we have very few congressional standards with regard to um, how to conduct a presidential election. Uh, Senators Ron Wyden and uh, Amy Klobuchar have put forth a bill with regard to uh, mail-in voting for the presidential election. It's, I would be surprised if it passed, given the partisanship that we continue to experience in the, uh, in the United States Congress. But nevertheless, it's an attempt, it's an 11th hour attempt to try to standardize our presidential election procedures throughout the state, throughout the 50 states and Washington DC. Um, and of course we have various states such as ours trying to uh, adopt makeshift uh, rules, laws, and regulations in order to make it easier to vote. But the long and short of it is that we will undoubtedly face in November a situation where various states have various ways of voting for the electors for president of the United States. That's what we vote for on election day, so-called election day. We vote for electors pledged to either Biden or Trump or whoever else uh, may be running. And we're going to have a huge variety of laws and regulations uh, relating to the way people are able to vote, which in effect, given the fact of this pandemic, and if it continues in full force, or even if it flattens out and it revives in the fall, um, there's a tremendous disincentive for people to go to vote in person, even for people to mail a, uh, a a ballot, it means they need to leave their home, put it in a mailbox and so on. There are tremendous disincentives for people to vote. So I think we can expect uh, um, very different kinds of turnout numbers in different states, depending upon what their very different laws and regulations are. Um, in, in a way, that's the way we've always conducted our presidential elections. They've always been uh, by design of the Constitutional Convention, by design, it, it, our, our presidential election, our local affairs. And so we can expect under these circumstances um, a relatively chaotic situation um, uh, unless the Congress of the United States steps up and whether they pass the widen Klobuchar bill or enact other kinds of legislation that relate across the board um, making it easier uh, for people to vote. I think that we're going to have a situation where, whereby um, the vote is very, the vote turnout is very uneven, and we may get, um, we may not know results in various states if there's a real increase in mail-in ballots. 
uh, for um, a number of days or even weeks. And I think that's what we face in November. Now, I started out by saying we will have an election. There have been from time to time, and no, this is nonpartisan, but I'm just stating a, a fact, there have been articles written about whether or not the president uh, may want to cancel the election. Um, and this, this occurred even before this pandemic and so on. And some of those articles were partisan in nature and so on. But it's a real question as, on people's mind as to whether, whether or not we can go forward. Well, the answer is, as a constitutional matter, the president serves for four years. And that term expires on noon on January 20th. And therefore, we need to have an election uh, uh, to uh, um, make certain that we have a, either a re-elected president or a new president uh, on January 20th. So he doesn't have any, and there is no provision or precedent for a president holding over past noon on January 20th, because we've never had a situation where we have post canceled or postponed an election whatsoever through depressions, through the civil war, through world wars, we have always held our election. So the president of the United States, this president or any other president has no uh, authority to cancel or even postpone the election. On the other hand, Congress does have the authority to postpone the election. I'm not advocating that. I'm just stating this as a as a fact because the Constitution states that um, uh, the states elect their electors, but directs the Congress to set the date as to when those electors will be elected. And since 1845, it has been the Tuesday after the first Monday in November. And it's kind of natural to us now. They picked that date because we were a rural country. People needed time from Sunday church going to get to the county seat in order to vote and so on. So we are still voting on the Tuesday after the first Monday in our federal elections and of course, that's developed into state elections for the most part as well. So we will vote on that day, uh, but Congress could change that. Congress can decide if the pandemic is raging, can postpone it, and then can postpone when the electors actually meet. Because the Constitution says that Congress picks the date when the electors are elected, election day, and when the electors who've been elected on election day, when we go to the polls, um, when those electors meet to actually vote for president of the United States. And also since the 1800s, that date has been set as in this case, it's the first Monday after the second Wednesday in December, which this year happens to be December 14th. So if everything goes the way it's supposed to, we go to the polls on November 3rd, we vote for electors pledged to Biden or to Trump. The electors meet on December 14th, they vote for president and on January 6th, the Congress tallies the vote to see who won uh, is gonna be the president of the United States and the vice president of the United States and they will be sworn in on the 20th. Congress can change those dates if it's, if it's necessary. It would be very disheartening if they did that to postpone an election, because as I said, we've never done that. But they could do that. President can't. President can't cancel, can't postpone. But Congress can't cancel, but can postpone those dates. So let's say the end of December, um, and then the electors meet, as long as we have a president to be able to be sworn in um, on January 20th. And I'm only raising that because um, we may face a situation where uh, the pandemic is, is really, uh, has reemerged in, in November um, to such an extent that we don't really expect to, for people to be able to vote and we don't have any federal standards and the states are a whole hodgepodge of laws and regulations. And it may make sense for Congress to do that. I'm not suggesting they do that, but I'm saying it may make sense. Luckily, we have a divided Congress. And the reason I say luckily is because with a Democratic House and a Republican Senate, it would have to be a bipartisan decision. 
And that would give us a great deal of comfort and confidence that it was a decision that was made in the national interest, at least uh, put forth by both Democrats and Republicans. So I just want to lay out then in short that we will have, the, we will have our election. It will be a chaotic situation. The president can't do anything about it. Congress can if it's necessary. And I want to address one other point. And that is, there's going to be a, um, uh, an argument before the Supreme Court of the United States on May 13th. Actually, it's going to be a virtual argument on the phone, uh, which is the first to the Supreme Court, as to whether or not electors can vote for whomever they want. If you recall, in 2016, there were a number of Hillary Clinton electors who tried to organize electors around the country to vote not for Hillary, but for other people in order to deny Trump a, a majority of the Electoral College vote. I never quite understood what their st strategy was, but in any event, it led to a number of electors uh, from the state of Washington being fined $1,000 each, which they've never paid, um, because they didn't vote for the uh, candidate who their state supported, in this case, Hillary. Um, and there has been uh, lawsuits started um, as a result of what occurred in 2016. And the Supreme Court of the United States is going to decide whether or not electors have that ability to use their discretion in order to uh, vote for whomever they want. And this also may have an impact uh, on the presidential election. Assuming it's held at the right time, the way it's supposed to be held, but even if it's postponed in the very unlikely event that that occurs, we vote for electors, the electors meet. Must they vote for whomever ha uh, was supported in their state? And let's say, for example, the vote in their state is such a mess because of mail-in procedures that went awry, because of people not being able to go to the polls, and the result is unclear. Then what happens? Well, what happens is there's this statute whereby that if a state votes for electors, goes to the polls on election day, and it's not clear who the winner is, then the state legislature can decide who the electors are. So in the unlikely event that people go to the polls and it's really unclear as to what, what occurred, what the results are and so on, the state legislature can convene pursuant to the constitution and choose its own set of electors, bypassing those who actually did vote. So I'm throwing another monkey wrench into this process of the, of the presidential election. Terry, can I, can I cut you off to can. time wise? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I went, a, I went a little over. I, I appreciate your timekeeping. No, you, you were making very good points. I wanted to let you speak, but I want to give Hillary the opportunity. Okay, absolutely. So um, Hillary, uh, what's going on in DC right now? Hey, how are you? Hold on one second, folks. I'm trying to uh, sure. share my options here. Well, wouldn't you know, it worked in a test run, but okay. Can you guys see the slides? We're good. You can see the slides? We can, yeah. Okay, great. All right. Uh, hi, thanks everybody. Uh, my name is Hillary Jockmans. Uh, like Richard said, I'm a consultant down here in Washington, but strong ties to New York. So I'm gonna to try to wrap things up here a little bit by talking on what is happening in DC. Um, this is a really interesting time here, obviously for many reasons, but this is a situation where we have three branches of government, all three branches of government, getting involved in the same issue, voting in the age of a pandemic at the same time. Usually you think about in the system of checks and balances that uh, you know the Congress might act on one thing and then the, the the president serves as a check or the president acts on something and the Supreme Court acts as a check on him. But in this case, all three are simultaneously looking at this issue. So I'm gonna try and touch up very quickly on uh, what Congress is doing, 
uh, both with money and their powers uh, and voting in election, voting in Congress. Take a quick look at the federal court's review of their congressional actions and uh, the Wisconsin case, and just wrap up quickly with a few thoughts on the presidential. Um, my colleagues- sorry, Hillary, if I could interrupt with one sure. really quick technical suggestion. If you go to slideshow and hit begin slideshow, then you'll, we'll only see the slides themselves instead of the miscellaneous stuff around them. Where yeah. is slideshow? Um, right in the middle top near over on the left. Right under your name, Jockman's PPT is slideshow. It's on that. Keep going to your left. Yep. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing it online. That's okay. In the bar with home. There it is. You're near it. You got it. Draw, keep going to the right. Yep. Design. Draw. Trans nope. Design. Keep going oh, to the right. And then, okay. There it is. Yep. Now hit play from current slide over on the left, second from the left. Play from start will work too. All right. Great. All right, Thanks I, so much. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to be moving my head. There we go. Okay. So, like I said, my colleagues touched on a lot of these points already, so I'll, I'll try to make some of this stuff brief. But um, in terms of uh, what Congress has done, uh, a couple weeks ago, they packed, passed the CARES Act, which was a $2 trillion relief measure that provided relief for hospital systems, small businesses, individual states. But as Jennifer said, there was also $4 million in there for states for election assistance. Um, this did require a 20% match, which a lot of people were not aware of at the time. Uh, is $4 million enough for the states? A lot of people don't think so. Um, the Brennan Justice Center has put the estimate closer to $2 billion for what states would need. So Congress is starting to look at uh, another round of stimulus and maybe there would be flexible money in there for states. Uh, some suggestions would be for money for printing additional ballots, purchasing the postage, like uh, one of my colleagues mentioned before, this does become expensive for folks. Um, more technology, recruiting people to work, and more uh, protective equipment and cleaning supplies. I mean, that was one of the problems we saw in Wisconsin, was that folks didn't want to work at the polls because they were concerned about their, their safety. And a lot of times these poll workers and poll volunteers are, are seniors and they are the more vulnerable uh, traditionally considered to be more vulnerable to, the, to this virus. So in addition to stimulus, con Congress is also looking at voting reform measures. Now, some of these are sort of perennial issues that come up uh, each Congress, and others are more COVID-19 specific. And the reform ideas include things we've talked about already, expanding voting by mail, online or same-day voter registration, uh, safety provisions, no excuse absentee voting, uh, offering applications for absentee ballots online. Right now you have to, in many cases, still code to an office to pick up your absentee ballot, which kind of defeats the purpose uh, if you're trying to, to, to shelter at home. So some of these have been incorporated into legislation uh, that Jerry mentioned as well, the Natural Disaster and Emergency Ballot Act. Uh, this is in both the House and the Senate. Uh, like you said, we don't know if this will be something that actually passes. This is sort of an 11th hour attempt to deal with the uncertainties that are, occur with an election during a, a pandemic. So I'm not going to go obviously go through all these points, but I listed them all here to show that it's a very detailed plan that they are proposing. And this is where, you know, some uh, people feel that this is Congress attempting to federalize elections too much. These are things that should be held more at the state level. Interestingly, Michelle Obama has endorsed this legislation, and this is the first time uh, the former First Lady has, has uh, expressed an opinion on a particular piece of legislation. Okay, so where does Congress get its powers to set elections? Uh, again, we've talked about this a little bit, but there's a uh, provision in both the Constitution as well as federal law. Um, ultimately, Congress does have final word if there's a disagreement between uh, state legislatures and Congress. Uh, but they work in tandem. There's also federal law that sets the date for the election, uh, which again, which Jerry mentioned, which is really important to keep in mind that any change in the state requires an act of Congress. So for years, people have been talking about alternatives for voting. You know, is the idea of standing in line for hours uh, so, sort of old school now, right? I mean, people have other things they have to do, and now we're concerned about safety, of, of you know, how do you social distance when you're going to do that? So two alternative voting ideas have come up, uh, internet voting and vote by mail. Internet voting seems attractive option, right? I mean, here we all uh, doing the CLE and lecture via the internet, 
but there are a lot of safety concerns and people have expressed uh, real worries about trying to go ahead with voting because of the, the, the weaknesses inherent in the system that just can't be fixed by election day. Um, and so vote by mail is looking like an attractive option, right? There are several states, although I spelled Utah wrong there, sorry about that, uh, several states that have all mail-in uh, already. Uh, many other states have some type of mail-in provisions. There have been concerns about voter fraud due to a lack of photo ID, where people have stolen mail ballots and then sent them in fraudulently. Uh, and while there have been instances, like I said, of voter fraud in this issue, there have been no major reports. So people are interested in ex further exploring this option. Uh, Colorado has all mail-in voting. Okay, so so far I've been talking about elections in terms of electing our, our representatives, but what about voting within the House? Um, currently the House rules do not allow for the chamber to vote remotely at all. Um, and any kind of rule change for this would require the members to ironically have to come back to Washington to vote on them not having to be in Washington to vote. Unless of course you could get a unanimous consent agreement, meaning everybody just says okay, and that's kind of unlikely. Um, but there is broad bipartisan support and uh, interest anyway in looking at remote voting. But Pelosi and McCarthy have both been skeptical about the ability to actually get this done. Um, and this raises a lot of issues and concerns as well as some constitutional and policy issues. We may not have time to delve into this too much, but any legal challenges to this would be a novel issue for the court. The courts have not looked at this type of thing before. So Pelosi tasked the chairs of the House Rules and Administration Committees to present options for voting uh, for their members if they were unable to be in Washington. And basically the recommendation was a proxy voting, which allows absent members to designate a colleague to vote on their behalf. There's no general proxy, so you know, a member can't just say to their party leader, hey, vote however you feel is appropriate. Um, it'd have to be very specific and direct another member to cast their vote in each and every vote. So think about if you're gonna have 20 procedural votes, this could be kind of complicated. They're gonna have to 20 different letters authorizing um, these votes. But the pro is that it, members still stay in control of their vote. But again, this presumes that there are still some members who are able to be uh, in Washington. Uh, there are obviously some concerns with these voting reforms, both um, constitutional and policy ones. And I know we're running low on time, but uh, let me just touch on the constitutional ones briefly. Um, the rulemaking power of the Constitution gives Congress the ability to set their, their rules, basically, for how they proceed. But they have to do so in a way that does not violate any other constitu constitutional provisions. And there are two key issues at play here, both the presence requirement and a quorum requirement. So, you know, what does present really mean? We're all present together here online. We're not present in a space. But when the founders came up, you know, drafted the Constitution, they had no idea what these technological advances that would develop. For them, present means sitting in a room. And you can see this from various uh, parts of the Constitution where they use words like attendance um, and things like that. So how do we work around this new technological developments um, while also making sure that we have a quorum? And this, I mean, getting too much into the weeds now, but basically, at the end of the day, what does it mean to be present? Are you online or in your seat? Um, there are also some policy concerns with these voting reforms idea if you're not uh, physically there. Congress is supposed to be a deliberative body. Um, you know, you're supposed to be communicating with your colleagues. Well, how do you do that if you're working remotely? Uh, and also, would these votes be vulnerable to fraud or cyber attacks? And I need to, Hillary, I need to share the CLE code um, okay. for those because we're just about at one o'clock. So um, if you're, uh, I just wanted to warn you because that's going to stop your sharing. Um, okay. And I'm going to put that up for everybody. The code is the word vote followed by the numeral four. Um, again, that's the word vote followed by the numeral four. Everybody should see it now. That's the only code that you'll all need for this presentation. Um, and since we are coming up on one o'clock, the panelists have kindly agreed to stay for a few more minutes um, to deal with questions and such. Uh, but for CLE credit, uh, as long as you have the code, you're welcome to go on to other meetings if, you're, um, if you find you have to do that. Um, so Hillary, let me turn that back to you and I apologize for the interruption. Okay. How do I get back the share screen? <laughs> Okay. Looks great. 
Okay, great. Um, all right, so we're talking about the role of federal courts. Uh, I'll just direct your attention to uh, 1892 case where the courts actually did look uh, at their role in evaluating what the House and Senate could do in terms of their rules. And this is uh, U.S. v. Ballin. Um, it basically set a, a standard for which the court would review congressional actions and making sure that anything that Congress did does not violate uh, other constitutional provisions. Um, federal courts have looked at this in terms of early voting, uh, but generally, like I said, the courts have been reluctant to get too heavily involved in what, uh, what Congress is doing. Uh, I'll touch briefly on the Wisconsin case study here. Uh, Wisconsin was the first state to have in-person voting amid the stay-at-home uh, order, but they had an overwhelming number of requests for absentee ballots, four times as many as they had in 2016. Um, like we said before, there was a lot of concern from workers about getting to the polls as well as the actual voters about going to vote. So the governor tried to delay the primary um, and this result in various court challenges back and forth, ultimately uh, ending up in the Supreme Court. And the majority said that the question for them was a technical one. Was a federal judge entitled to change a state's absentee voting procedures just days before the election? And the majority said no. You can see the other quotes there, although I can't on my own screen. Um, they said extending the date by which ballots may be cast by voters, not just received by the municipal clerks, but cast by voters, for an additional six days after the scheduled election day fundamentally alters the nature of the election. Um, but they did go on to point out that this was a narrow question uh, and should not be viewed as expressing an opinion on the broader question of whether to hold the election. Uh, the minority felt differently. Justice Ginsburg uh, saw this more as an enfranchisement issue um, and she felt that it did uh, warrant extending uh, the, the time for the app, for the uh, ballots to come in. So what's the basically what are the implications of this? Well, for some, it reinforces the idea that the court is not bipartisan. In fact, it is partisan because it was a five to four ruling and the majority uh, w was comprised of the Republican appointed nominated justices uh, and they sided with the Republicans in Wisconsin. And the minority in the case was comprised of the Democratic nominated justices who backed the Wisconsin Democratic position. Um, ultimately, there's probably going to be more litigation to come, not necessarily about Wisconsin, but about other elections coming down. And will this partisan or at least perceived partisan divide um, continue? And lastly, I know we talked a lot about the presidential already, um, but just in general, there's a lot of uncertainty going forward, right? I mean, the laws and governing elections can be changed by an act of Congress. Um, any review by courts, like I said, is going to be an issue of first impression because I haven't had something like this before. And you know the threat, the president could be threatening to ch uh, change the election date or postpone. We don't know, but one thing we do know is the certainty is the twentieth amendment. This was something. Uh, well, the date was changed. The concept was enshrined in the original constitution. The framers wanted to have a definite date for when the presidency could end, and the presidency ends at noon on January twentieth, twenty twenty one. So with that, I will stop. Well, let me thank all of the panelists for what I think has been a fascinating presentation. Um, you've uh, laid out the issues, you've shown us the challenges, and uh, uh, again, under these very, very difficult conditions, a very large thank you to the panelists. And if we have time, Ava, do we have any questions for you? We do. So for those who want to stick around, um, I'm just going to, I think the easiest thing is if I just tell you what all the questions are and each of you can decide um, which of those you'd like to address. Um, so one question uh, which picks up on the very last note that Hillary ended on um, is what happens if President Trump loses the election and refuses to vacate his position? Uh, what happens next? Uh, some of the other questions have to do with absentee balloting. There's a lot of interest in that. Um, there's concerns about the financial integrity of the post office. Someone asks, what if the post office goes bankrupt? What happens if it does and if there's no mail? Someone else asks um, on the absentee balloting again, um, why, was this, why did the state fail to commit money under HAVA? Um, uh, the question is, was that deliberate, which I, I, I take to mean something about was there the 
um, intent and intention there. Um, but also on the practicalities of absentee balloting, someone says um, there's a challenge to the county board of elections to just train the poll inspectors since they normally do it in person with good sized groups. Uh, and someone else asks, when the Board of Elections receives absentee ballots, how manual is that process? Um, maybe that refers to as opposed to uh, computers. And someone else wants to know, was there an illegal case of harvesting absentee ballots by a city council candidate about 20 years ago? Um, so if anybody knows about that, someone is curious. And finally, um, someone asks about the state match, uh, again, under have a uh, can that match be made up by localities or private donations, or does it have to be state funds? Um, and the very last question is, is there any thought about conducting all federal, state, and local primaries on the same day in New York? Seems like it would be more efficient and as a policy matter, encourage more voter turnout. So maybe, Hillary, since the first question seems like a direct response to you on what happens if the president leaves office, why don't we start with you and then other people can join in and, and answer questions as they think appropriate. Sure, well, um, it's sort of a fascinating thing you can game out and really go down the rabbit hole of, of all the different scenarios if an election, I'm presuming the question is if an election does not happen in November, what happens then or whatever. Um, you know, we don't have any succession plan, right? It's not like the the president passes away in office and the, the, the vice president and the speaker of the house, there's no plan like that. And you can't even really look to that as a model because um, remember also the uh, house members, uh, their terms end on a date certain as well, which is January 3rd. So come January 3rd, uh, all the house members, their terms are up if they haven't been reelected and a third of the Senate is is up as well. So you, you go down a, a long path of where you could find yourself and who could be an interim president and even the states get involved in this. So it's it's a it's a fascinating sort of law school theory uh, but let's hope we don't we don't get to that point. Well let me just let me just add a little uh, the states don't get involved in that at all. It's um, and the 20th the um, the Constitution says if uh, there's no president or vice president in the un, in the very unlikely circumstance that um, there's no presidential election because that's just not going to happen. But since you posited as a hypothetical, um, if there's no president or vice president pursuant to uh, statute, the Speaker of the House of the new Congress uh, takes over. So if the if the president were to somehow magically cancel the election, then uh, the likelihood is great that the House will uh, continue to be in Democratic hands and he will have to uh, accede to um, Speaker Pelosi as the next president of the United States. But that, but that, that is not going, that's really not uh, going to happen. If, if he loses, the real question was the first question. The, if he loses, and it's clear that Biden won, and he refuses to acknowledge that Biden won because of fraud, because of the pandemic, for a variety of reasons, the Constitution is very clear that he needs to leave office. And at that point, what does the public do? What does the Congress do? What do the courts do? And I would bet anything that even this Supreme Court Supreme Court would uh, verify that he needs to leave office and um, um, and make certain that Biden takes office. We don't want to even think about what has occurred in various countries around the world about the role of the military and so on. Uh, but I think he would be on extremely shaky grounds on this very, very um, uh, unlikely event. And why don't we, um, Jennifer, I think there were a lot of questions about the absentee balloting process. Maybe you could. Yeah, uh, and I, I think I can answer like a couple of them in one in one shot. Um, so on the, the have a funny, I think it was the next question on why didn't the state commit? And I think it was the state board of elections had told us that they had flagged this for the legislature, had flagged it for the governor. And it was just one of those things where elections at the time didn't seem as important as all the other things related to coronavirus. So it was just sort of an afterthought. 
Mm -hmm. um, and as far as the question of the, the match, how could that be made? It can be made privately, but localities, because county boards of elections have to spend this money anyway, it can be an in-kind match for the 20% that they're supposed to commit. Um, and then I think one of the other big questions was uh, how absentee ballots, if they're manually processed, and I think John can probably answer this a bit too, but it depends on the county because in some counties, they can process them through their regular uh, voting machine, but in other counties, they don't have the same technology. They have to count the ballots by hand. So it really depends on the county. Oh, John, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, go ahead, John. Counties like Westchester, they scan it into the machine and it records like a regular ballot cast in, in, in person. A couple of the other uh, absentee ballot questions. There was, in fact, uh, I don't know the name of the person that was convicted, but there was a conviction a number of, a number of years ago on harvesting ballots in a Yonkers City Council race, that I recall. Uh, the issue of, of poll worker training, in Westchester, they canceled poll worker training because the governor's executive order came out barring gatherings of people in person. So they have to gear up to be able to do poll worker training uh, like this and through Zoom or WebEx or through some other remote way, which they have not really geared up to do. That's an issue. And then with the postponement of the presidential primary to June 23rd, we do have the presidential primary on the same date as the other primaries. Uh, I think the difficult question is gonna be dealing with general elections and primary elections on the same day with different ballots. And can you program a machine to handle that? Or you have to have different machines and more machines to be able to deal with the general election ballots and the primary election ballots. Okay, great. And I think that we got one more question, which which maybe is a good note to end on, which is um, someone asked uh, in response to what we learned about the county boards of elections not providing for our online application, what should people do if their county board of elections doesn't provide for online application and says no online fax email applications for absentee ballots? Um, Jennifer, what would you recommend? I think the best thing for voters to do is to give their board, their county board of elections a call first. And a lot of them are at least having limited hours or they have somebody's cell phone number on the website we've seen. So you can call and request that they mail you a paper application, but you'll still have to go through the process of postaging it yourself and sending it back in yourself. But I know right now, New York City, who is just, of course one of our biggest localities has said online applications, we can't do it. There's no way we can scale up in time. So if New York City is saying that, I'm sure a lot of counties are going to say that too. It's just not possible at this point. But obviously the ideal would be everyone could just email your county board of elections. Here's my name, my address, and the election I want to vote in and get their ballot. But give yeah, give your county board of elections a call. I know Westchester's getting swamped with uh, requests for absentee ballots online. Online. All right, well, that's all the questions we have. Um, Richard, I don't know if you wanna add anything, but I just wanna echo Richard's thanks to the panelists. Thanks to everybody for joining us for our first online Anderson seminar. And I found this wonderful. So again, I, I can't say how grateful I am to all of you. Richard, is there anything you wanna add or shall we? Only that uh, I think uh, the audience has a lot of additional information, a lot of very difficult questions to think about. Uh, and uh, ideas, uh, thoughts uh, that come to anyone's mind would certainly be welcome uh, if we go through the challenges. Thank right, you for well, doing this. On that note, thank you so much, everybody. Thank we'll you. end there. Uh, stay healthy, everyone. Thank, thank you so you. much. Yep. Bye bye. bye.